Okay, let's talk about backpropagation in neural networks. In order to understand backpropagation, we need to first draw the structure of our network. And in this example, we're only going to deal with three layers, the input, the hidden layer, and the output layer. But please know that this will generalize to more than one hidden layer. Notice in this network, we have M inputs, N hidden neurons, and P outputs. And we start the indexing from zero on the inputs and the hidden layer because those need a bias neuron. Those bottom neurons are the bias. We don't have a bias on the output. That's why we start counting from one. Let's think about what the weights look like for this particular model. The one on the left maps the inputs to the hidden layer. And notice the number of rows. It's M plus one. Uh, now, obviously, when we're using NumPy, the indexing actually always starts at zero, but the numbers I'm drawing on the rows and the columns here refer to the index of the neuron in that layer. So because we have the bias on the inputs, the rows here, we start from zero and go to M. On the hidden layer, we don't have a line connecting inputs to the bias on the hidden layer. That's why I'm starting the columns at one, one, two, three, all the way up to N. Okay, and then the same thing happens when we map the hidden layer to the outputs. The rows here go from zero to N, the zero being the bias in the hidden layer. And then the columns go from one to P. P is the number of outputs. So the process of backpropagation is essentially answering the question, how do we update these weights? And the simplest way to view this equation is to say that we've got some array of weights showing that as like a vector here. And the new value of the weights will be based on the current value plus some change, right? A delta to each of those weights. What is that delta? Well, it's equal to negative eta times this really interesting looking term. This is a partial derivative, a partial derivative of C with respect to the weights. What are all the terms involved in this equation? Eta here, this is the learning rate, and the C that we're taking the derivative of is the cost or the error. This process has a special name. It's called gradient descent. The gradient is the derivative. The negative is what's telling us that we're descending. Let's think about this conceptually real quick. Suppose that I could plot the cost or the error of our model for the current value of the weights, or in this case, um, perhaps just one of the weights. And let's say without loss of generality that we have this nice uh, parabolic curve. Now in practice, the curves won't look quite uh, as simple as this, and obviously it's not restricted to one dimension. We will have thousands or millions of dimensions here based on the size of our, our, our weight arrays, uh, but the point uh, will still stand the same. Suppose that we have a current value of those weights. Okay, for that current value of weights, we have some associated cost. Our goal is to minimize the cost. We want the error to be as low as possible. Well, how do we move our weights in a direction that will lower the cost? Well, we look at the slope of the cost function here, the red curve, and we descend. We go to an area where it's smaller. We want to minimize this cost. So what we might end up doing is increasing W so that the new cost ends up over here. So maybe we've overshot the minimum a little bit. But if we reevaluate and look at the slope of the curve here and descend again, we might come back to the left and over time, in theory, we should find some sort of uh, local minima, right? That's the goal. We want to find W star, okay? And the learning rate defines how, how big a jump we want to make. If the learning rate is large, we're going to jump around in big steps. If it's small, we're going to take very small steps, but it might take longer to get down to that minimum. If we knew what this red curve looked like, like if we had a, a definition of the function that generated that red curve, we could just take the derivative, set it equal to zero, find that local or global minima, and then we'd be done. We'd have a perfect model. But here's the reality. When we're solving problems with machine learning, 
we don't know what the underlying function is. We're trying to approximate that function using data that has patterns. Right? So if I give our model a batch of data with some known labels and I compute the cost, I am estimating the true cost based on the batch that I have. So this update equation is technically more like this. I want to have a new weight array on the next batch, the B plus one, based on the weights at the current iteration for our, our, our batch right now, plus some change in those weights based on that batch. So the B here is referring to a batch. We might also use the term iteration. Because I'm using batches that aren't a perfect representation of the true cost of the function that we're trying to optimize, they're just an approximation, Gradient descent actually is referred to here as stochastic gradient descent, okay? And in the literature or in documentation, you might see this abbreviated as SGD. And there's another term that I should alert you to. I'll put it on this empty white space here. Um, and that term is called an epoch, E P O. CH. An epic is when we have one pass of all our training data. So let's think about this mathematically. If our training data had a thousand samples and on each batch, every iteration for which we will update the weights in the network, we use 10 samples, thousand total samples, 10 samples in a batch. How many batches or iterations do we need for one epic? Pause the video and answer that now for yourself. Did you figure it out? It should be 100 batches or iterations. 100 iterations of a batch size of 10 will give 1,000 samples, which is our entire training data. That's what an epic is. So be careful when we talk about epics versus iterations. Okay, now that we know the high level concepts of what's happening in backpropagation using stochastic gradient descent, let's try and work out these equations mathematically. And in order to do that, we need to answer another important question. We talked about this variable C that we're going to take the partial derivative of. What is C? What is the cost or the error of our network? There are many options and backpropagation is still a valid approach no matter what cost you use, as long as it's differentiable. But there's two that I want to highlight that are popular in terms of training neural networks. The first one is the mean squared error. The second, cross entropy. For today, we're gonna to focus on the mean squared error. Okay, it's one half times the sum from I equals one to P. P is the number of outputs of the squared error, t sub i minus y sub i. So that's the target value for the ith neuron minus the predicted value for that neuron. t is the target, y is the prediction. And we would sum this up for the entire batch. So the i here, notice it doesn't refer to samples, it refers to the different neurons in the output. And also notice that I'm writing this cost as a function of w, the weights, right? Because it's the weights of the network that are influencing the error. But you'll notice in the equation on the right of the equal sign, I don't see any W's explicitly written. This is what makes uh, deriving the equations a little bit difficult because we can't just take the derivative of the right side of the equation with respect to W if we have no idea where the W's are. So you should be asking yourself, how are the W's involved in this cost? So what I'd like to derive now, we have to, we have, to have equations that will update each of the weights in the network. Recall that there are two types of weights. There is the input to hidden layer weights, that's the W1 here, and the hidden to the output weights, that's the W2. Since we are starting from the outputs and working our way back, it would make sense to update the hidden to output weights first. Those are probably the easier ones because they have what feels like more direct influence on each of the output neurons. So let's do that first. And remember, when we're making these updates, what we're trying to determine is what is the partial derivative of the cost with respect to 
the weights that we want to update. In other words, how much does a given weight influence the error that we're seeing in the network? So I'm writing this partial derivative of C with respect to an individual weight now, W, J, K. The J is going to index the hidden layer, and the K is going to index the output that we want. And in fact, it may even be better to update our cost equation that we had above where we used I just for consistency here. Let's change that uh, to K. Right, so I refers to the inputs, J refers to a hidden layer, and K refers to the output. So now what you should ask yourself, do you see the variable WJK in the equation for cost? The obvious answer here is no. All we see is T and Y. Which of those variables, T or Y, has W kind of inside of it, buried deep inside? Think about that for a moment. So it's not going to be the t's, right? The target values are just labels for our data. There's no w that's influencing the target. The w is influencing the prediction of the network, the y. So what we can do here, using an approach called the chain rule, we can rewrite the partial derivative as the product of the partial derivative of the cost with respect to the output yk times the partial derivative of yk with respect to wjk. Hopefully it's clear to see that just like in multiplying fractions, the denominator of the first term and the numerator of the second would cancel and we'd have uh, equality here. But now ask yourself, does yk directly depend on wjk? So it turns out that y is not a function directly of w, it's a function of an activation going into that neuron. And in fact, we called this the activation function, sigma. So there's no w explicitly here, which means we need to reapply the chain rule. y is a function related to a sub k, and then we should be able to take the partial derivative of a sub k with respect to the weights that we care about. So let's move this equation for y off to the side so we can make some room here. And tell you what, let's also write the equation for a sub k as a function of w, just to make sure that we can stop the partial derivative here. Okay, so now bank propagation for updating this weight matrix uh, comes down to figuring out each of these three partial derivative terms. Let's do that one by one. Let's start with the equation on the left, the partial derivative of the cost with respect to y sub k. So to do this, I want to, I want to expand the equation for the cost, the mean squared error, which is the one that we're using here today. So if I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to a specific y, that means that all of the other y's don't matter. They're effectively constants in this equation that we're um, taking, that we're differentiating. Okay, the targets are also constants. There are variables that we don't care about at the moment. So, you know, this one's going to go to zero, this one's going to go to zero. Every one of these terms will be zero when we differentiate it, except for the term that has the kth neuron that we care about. And when we look at that kth neuron, how do we take the derivative of this function? Well, we multiply, uh, or we bring the, the exponent down, so this becomes 1 half times 2 times tk minus yk, and then we subtract 1 from the exponent, right? so that will just become 1, which is tk minus yk, times the derivative of what's in the parentheses. Well, the derivative of the t is 0, the derivative of negative yk with respect to yk is just negative 1. So simplifying this equation, the 2s will cancel, the exponent doesn't matter anymore, and then the, the negative can come to the front here. So this becomes negative tk minus yk. That is the derivative of the cost with respect to a particular output neuron yk. Let's make some room so that we can figure out 
the other derivatives here. The next derivative that we need to determine is the partial derivative of yk, our output, with respect to the activation that comes into that output neuron. Now, we already uh, are showing here that yk is equal to sigma k of ak. And since we don't explicitly know what sigma is here, we can actually just write this as sigma prime with respect to ak. Right, it's just a function. We'd have to specify our activation function to know what the derivative is. As a quick fun fact, you may recall that we discussed one of the most common activation functions, at least historically with neural networks, is the sigmoid function. Turns out that the derivative of this function has a really nice form. Derivative of the sigmoid is simply equal to the sigmoid times one minus the sigmoid. Okay, so you could plug in that orange equation to the partial derivative that we have written in red if we are using the activation function uh, of the sigmoid. All right, and now we just need our third and final partial derivative. How do we take the derivative of ak with respect to the weight that we want to update, wjk? Well, let's look at that equation in orange. ak equals the sum of wjk times zj. This might be helpful. Let me try and expand that equation. So we can write the activation going into a particular output neuron as being equal to uh, w... Ah, and actually, as I look at this now, I think that I ignored the bias here. This probably should have been starting from index zero, zero to n, so that we had the weight corresponding to the bias from the hidden layer. Make that correction in your notes. Uh, so this should be w zero k z zero plus w one k z one plus so on and so forth. I'm going to generically write a j in here. And then eventually this would get to an n k z n. And I ran out of space. If we're taking the derivative of this function with respect to a particular value of j, that means that all of the other terms here are just constants. They end up going to zero. Zero, zero, zero everywhere, except for the term that involves the weight that we want to update. And when we take the derivative of this with respect to that weight, the derivative becomes z. I think my voice cracked there. That was weird. z sub j. So now that we have the partial derivatives, we can write a final full equation for how we update a given weight that maps a hidden neuron to an output neuron. And that update is equal to the current value minus eta, our learning rate. We are descending according to the gradient. But notice the gradient here has a negative term out in the front. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel those negatives, putting plus eta times the target value of the output minus predicted value of that output times the derivative of our activation function with respect to the activation going into that output neuron times the output of the hidden neuron that the weight is attached to. This is the final equation. And it turns out that we actually can simplify this uh, in some sense. We describe this as being the sensitivity of the output neuron K, which if we do that, the update simplifies to this. Eta times the sensitivity of our output neuron K times the output of our hidden layer neuron ZJ. This is the equation for updating the weights in that second array. Let's now derive the same kinds of equations for updating the previous array. That's the input to hidden weights. Updating these weights will be a little bit more tricky because we are further back in the network. So understanding, in fact, let me show you the network again, right? Understanding how the weights here influence the output. It's not that challenging because the lines directly connect to the outputs. But understanding how a weight back here influences one of the outputs is a really convoluted idea because there's a lot that still has to happen in the network. And if we were to have even more hidden layers, 
working our way back further through the network, the equations become more and more challenging. So we're doing the same process. We need to figure out how much is the error, the cost C, due to a weight IJ. This is the weight that connects input I to hidden neuron J, okay? And as we look back at their equation for the cost, obviously that has nothing, to, if it had nothing to do with WJK, it certainly has nothing to do with WIJ. So we're gonna need to apply that chain rule again. What is C a function of? It's a function of the output ZJ of our hidden neuron. We'll have to unpack what that means in a second. Uh, but if, if we can get back to that stage, almost as if we're ignoring the, the output layer now uh, and applying the same chain rule as before, we then have ZJ as a function of AJ, the activation going into that hidden neuron. And then AJ is directly a function of the weight WIJ that we want to update. And again, this is the chain rule. Let's write some equations off to the side here to help us out. So ZJ is equal to some activation function of the activation A sub J for that hidden neuron. And in fact, we can probably get rid of the subscript on the sigmas here because as I mentioned before, we traditionally will have the same activation function for every neuron in a given layer. And then AJ is equal to a weighted sum from J is zero, or excuse me, not J anymore, from I is zero to M first to the inputs here, WIJ times XI. You'll notice as well, I'm removing the superscript of the one and the two. That's so that we don't clutter the equations too much, but hopefully it's clear that the input to hidden weights, that's the W1 array. And we're subscripting this with IJ and the hidden to output weights, that was the W2 that we are subscripting with JK. So we need to solve for these partial derivatives. Let me start with the easier ones. Partial derivative of Z with respect to A, talking about the jth input or hidden uh, neuron here, well, that's simply equal to sigma prime of A sub J, okay? And then the derivative of A with respect to WIJ, A sub J with respect to WIJ, well, that's very similar to the partial derivative we took for the hidden to output weight array. Turns out here that that's just going to be the ith input. Okay, and now we gotta do the hard one. So this we're gonna have to derive in a couple lines. What is the partial derivative of the cost or our error with respect to the output of hidden neuron J? Okay, let me write this more explicitly. So there is our equation for the cost. And now instead of applying the chain rule here, I'm actually just going to take the derivative. So taking the derivative of this expression amounts to doing the same thing as before. We bring the two, the exponent down, so that cancels the one half. We're going to end up with a negative in front because of the derivative of the negative yk. Right, that'll cause the negative to come out. So we've got the negative sum from k equals one to p of t minus y. So the exponent has become a one, we subtract two minus one. And then we have to write the partial derivative of yk with respect to zj. Let's apply the chain rule now. Okay, and just to be clear, this sum is over this entire set of terms. Okay, and now we need to figure out some partial derivatives here. So the partial derivative of yk with respect to ak, well, let's look back on our previous slide. What is yk? yk is right here. It's the activation function applied to ak. If we take the derivative of that, that simply becomes sigma k prime with respect to ak. Okay, now let's do the partial derivative of ak. That's the 
activation into the output neuron K with respect to the output of the hidden neuron J. Well, we need to, we need to get the equation for that. And to do that, let's probably copy that over. Okay, notice the similarity between A sub J and A sub K. Very similar equations. The sums go over different values, zero to M versus zero to N. The weights are obviously referring to different arrays. The first one here is array one. The second one is array two. Xi is the input of the ith neuron. Zj is the output of the jth hidden neuron. So similar equations. And in fact, we took the partial derivative of a sub k previously, but we did it with respect to wjk. And as a quick note, the partial derivative of a sub k with respect to wjk, that's what we did on the previous slide, that's not the same thing as the partial derivative of a k with respect to zj. This second one is what we want now. So we need to figure out what that will be based on the equation in orange. If we were to write out this sum of weights times z's, and we're looking for the derivative with respect to a particular value of z, then it turns out that the partial derivative is just the weight j corresponding to that output k. So with this in mind, let's try and write out the full equation for updating one of the weights that maps a, an input neuron to a hidden neuron. I'm gonna to need to move some stuff over just to make some room here. W i j, the new value W i j will be based on the current value or the old value, minus, because we're descending, some eta times a partial derivative, except that we see that there's still a negative in this partial derivative. That negative is going to cancel with the minus, so we'll put plus here, plus eta times, let's put this entire partial derivative that we just wrote with the sum, k equals one to p of tk minus yk times sigma prime k of ak times wjk times the other two partial derivatives uh, towards the top here, sigma prime j of aj times x sub i. Okay, and then you might recall that we define sensitivity of the output neuron uh, k as this delta k, and it turns out we can actually define the sensitivity of the hidden neuron, j, as delta j, which means that we could rewrite this entire equation as uh, the update being eta times the sensitivity of j times xi. So updating a weight that connects uh, the ith input to the jth hidden neuron is proportional to eta, the learning rate, how big a jump do we want to make, the sensitivity of that output neuron and the input of um, uh, xi, the ith uh, input neuron. This is the equation we would have to program if we wanted to do back propagation by hand. For this class, I don't need you to be able to derive these equations as we have in this video. However, I do think it's important that you understand what each component of these equations represents. So I'd like you to be able to describe if I showed you this equation, number one, if I showed you this equation and gave you values for the weights, for the targets, for the learning rate, for the inputs, you should be able to compute an update for a given weight. Uh, but you should also recognize that in our network, we've got some input that has some weight to a hidden layer neuron. That's the WJ. This is the only WI, or excuse me, the WIJ. This is the only weight that we care about mapping the input to the hidden layer. That's what we're trying to update with these, this equation. That weight is influenced by the weights coming out of that hidden neuron to all of the outputs, right? So uh, this sensitivity is looking at the sensitivity of these outputs multiplied in proportion to the weights of those outputs because that error should work its way back through this hidden neuron J. And then that needs to be proportional to the input XI. 
That's what this equation means. I realized that that was confusing. You might need to watch this back. You might need to like sit and digest this equation for a while. But that is the math behind backpropagation in neural networks using stochastic gradient descent. Thanks so much for watching.